We always felt that we have the right to travel around the world, collect animals or other stuff and bring it to our museums and our zoos. And I think the majority of people think it's the natural right to do so. Why shouldn't we? I think the basic drive behind museums is curiosity. Curiosity about the world around us. But then we have this problem of finding order because we have as human beings difficulties in accepting chaos. We need order. It gives us a sense of security and certainty. Everything should have its place in a system, no better it may be a God-given sort of system or a more rational scientific sort of system, but we love to make systems. Les premiers animaux sauvages exotiques, on les voit souvent arrêtés, arriver en Europe sous la forme de peau, euh, sous la forme de cadavres. L'animal sauvage au 19e siècle, et notamment les carnassiers ou les singes, ce sont par définition des animaux dangereux. Ce sont par définition des ennemis. À l'époque, au 19e siècle, on a l'impression que vis-à-vis -vis de ces animaux, il n'y a que deux solutions. Soit elles acceptent de se soumettre, soit si elles ne veulent pas coopérer, si elles ne veulent pas être domestiquées, eh bien elles doivent être exterminées. Les préserver dans leur milieu, les gens du 19e siècle ne voient pas à quoi ça peut servir. Et au 19e siècle, c'est vraiment l'époque de la nature féroce. Si vous lisez maintenant les récits de voyage des auteurs du 19e siècle, Il tire à chaque page, il tue à chaque page. Un bon animal, c'est un animal mort. I think we all of us have experienced this if we're passionate about the natural world, whether it's been seeing a, a flight of geese at sunset or seeing a, a whale breach next to the boat. Or All of us have these epiphanies, these uh, moments where we're just uh, overwhelmed with the beauty and wonder of nature. And we're changed. We want more and we want to do whatever we can to save and preserve. And that's the goal of the diorama. The diorama is really meant to connect with the heart as art does and to change attitudes and affect thought processes and awaken passions and connections with nature. There was a real intersection of art and science, where artists were employed to recreate nature in diorama form for people who would never be able to travel to remote regions or see Africa. So there's really this grand mission of reaching everyone and making them aware of the natural world. And I think Darwin's publications definitely drove that as well, that people suddenly realized that we are one with every other living thing on Earth, and yet we're sawing the very branch that we're standing on and endangering uh, future generations by doing so. There was a romantic aspect of digging deeper into nature and loving it and celebrating it. I think that certainly the American Museum of Natural History was founded because a group of rich men in New York decided 
that they had to bring nature in the midst of all this industrial revolution. We needed to reconnect with nature. And all museums, I think, were also anxious that the world was changing, even then, and it was vanishing. So they had to hurry up and gather these things and bring them so that we would have them in perpetuity. The Akeley journey was very much a part of my life. And I was obsessed with animal behavior. So I started reading all this stuff, including books on primates. And every time I would walk through the Akeley Hall and I would see that gorilla diorama, I would say, oh, what a ghastly man. He killed these gorillas. It was very upsetting to me. So then I started reading about him. And I said, oh my god. He saved these animals from extinction. So I was totally turned around. He was one of the most fascinating human beings that I'd ever encountered. Very early on, he started expressing himself in this form of taxidermy. Then he moved it into a major art form. Even today, no one does taxidermy better than Carl Akeley. Tout le long du 19e siècle, les naturalistes ne s'intéressent pas beaucoup aux jardins zoologiques. Et on voit très bien qu'au jardin zoologique de Paris, on laisse les animaux vivants au public. Le public vient les voir, etc. Et en fait, dès qu'un animal meurt, alors là, on voit les professeurs du muséum se précipiter et se disputer pour avoir la dépouille, pour pouvoir faire la dissection et étudier sa morphologie, son anatomie. Au 19e siècle, il y avait énormément de monde qui allait dans les muséums d'histoire naturelle. Et beaucoup de villes avaient un muséum d'histoire naturelle, mais n'avaient pas forcément de jardin zoologique. Even the great scientists and those who were campaigning for protection were adept at collecting specimens, which is a polite word for shooting, because again, you had no binoculars or cameras. The only way you could study birds or animals was to shoot them and get them up close. I think, especially those of us who have grown up in urban areas and city areas, have a very aesthetic and uh, spiritual view of nature in the natural world, which is a good thing. But it's very different, I think, than a century ago, where nature was a source of natural resources and food, and um, there wasn't much thought about it ever running out. And maybe among certain individuals, they didn't care if it did, as long as they could make a profit from it. In my own case, I came from a family that really viewed nature as an expression of the divine. You reverenced nature. It was a wonder and a marvel. And um, I'm glad of that, uh, but I have found myself over my years at the museum playing out roles where I had to collect animals. And um, killing things is, I don't think uh, you'd be strange if you enjoyed it. Uh, there's the thrill of the chase and the stalk and uh, the understanding that you know enough to think like the creature itself and outsmart it. But the actual deed of taking its life and seeing uh, it immediately afterwards, realizing that uh, so much of makes it what it is, is the fact that it's a living thing.
Carl was a hunter his whole life. And he wasn't squeamish at all about hunting. He grew up with it. Rules changed for him when he got to Africa. After Carl Akeley killed his first gorilla, the um, old man of Mikeno, he had to go back to camp with the skin, and he worked on the skin night and day until he could prepare it for return back to the New York Museum. He said, science is a jealous mistress and takes little account of man's feelings. So he pushed his feelings aside because he had measurements to make, photographs to take, he made the death masks of the gorillas. He, he had so much to do. And in spite of his feelings about killing the gorilla, and in spite of his profound exhaustion, he had to do science. And he had to do it accurately and perfectly. And he started feeling differently about gorillas because this animal felt very much like a, a human to him. And then he went out again to um, hunt again by himself. And he went out and he saw another animal. And he shoots it. And then as this animal falls, it bangs him on the head. He falls. And this animal keeps going down into the canyon. And at the same time, right after that, another animal comes charging through and hits him and keeps going. And that's a little one. That's her son. So he's running around screaming, and he's in a little clearing. And one of Carl Akeley's African guides had just found the baby and um, speared it. So Akeley arrives at this little creature, and he looks down. And Akeley says that the baby looked up and just was crying and wanted. He said he would have come into my arms if I'd let him. So Akeley saw in that moment wonder and fear. And he, it was the moment of metanoia for him. It was his rebirth. He, um, he, he realized, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. And so he. He didn't kill any more gorillas after that. He even named this little gorilla after himself. He named him Carly, which is what the kids called him in school. Um, he states that it took all of his scientific ardor to uh, keep from feeling like a murderer. This. Uh, somewhat unfeeling museum collector is writing um, in a way that he had never done before. You know, he's seeing these animals as um, individual beings with feelings and emotions and expressions. So it did spill over into his psyche, and he was a very different man after that. So the next day he went out hunting again, but he went out with his camera. So he took his camera, and by this time it was the Akeley camera, and he went and took the first pictures, photos, or film of mountain gorillas in the wild. He very much saw himself as an old gorilla. Carl Akeley used to sign his letters, the old gorilla. It was a real journey, a psychological and spiritual and evolutionary journey for him in his own life. And certainly inspired him enough to want to protect them into perpetuity, create this big national park that should protect them. That's what the goal was. And the fact that any gorilla is left on the planet is his greatest legacy. Environmentalists in particular often point out that we have a uh, great interest in what they sometimes dismissively call charismatic megafauna. 
So we're interested in animals that are sort of at the top of their ecosystem. And we're not concerned with animals that are at lower trophic levels where they may actually play a much more important role in the ecosystem. A classic case of this are the whales. You could eliminate the whales from the oceans and the disruption of ocean ecosystems would be much less than if you eliminate the krill. But nobody particularly goes around saying, save the krill. But at the same time, we are charismatic megafauna. And it's not surprising that we should be interested in others that are in some ways like us. I mean, if we can't care about them and respond to them strongly and try to protect them, then how can we possibly imagine that we can protect snakes and lizards and beetles and all the other creeping, crawling things on the planet? It's a little ironic that the people who've taught us most about gorillas and about uh, chimpanzees are non-scientists who developed empathy for the animals they were studying, which is Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey. They came from a non-scientific background and Having empathy for an animal is absolutely essential to coming to recognize that the animal needs to be a free agent. One of the first things I noticed in zoos, one of the earliest things, was that they absolutely hated um, the idea of saying that, of talking about an animal being happy. They said, that's anthropomorphic. You can't, you can't give human emotions to animals. And it was many, many years later, uh, I discovered that Darwin was giving human emotions to animals. He recognized that all animals have emotions and that we're all essentially emotional beings. Le lien entre jardin zoologique et muséum d'histoire naturelle est ancien. Jusqu'au début du XXe siècle, le zoo est une vitrine de ce qu'on est allé conquérir dans les autres continents. Et on en fait, on les montre dans des cages qui sont des espèces de vitrines. De la même manière que l'on conquiert ces continents, on veut conquérir cette faune sauvage. À leur création, les zoos, enfin, mais même toujours aujourd'hui, ça fait partie des grosses contradictions. Avoir des animaux en captivité, c'est une vision complètement anthropocentrique du monde et c'est une vision de la domination de l'homme sur le monde. Et les détracteurs ou les intellectuels, les philosophes qui parlent des zoos et qui sont un petit peu contre les zoos, disent qu'aujourd'hui, le zoo continue à promouvoir la vision colonialiste de l'Occident et la vision de dominance sur les autres espèces. Oui. C'est vrai. C'était, C'est l'une des, des représentations du, des parcs zoologiques, mais ce n'est pas la représentation. Et après, on peut aussi se poser des questions existentialistes euh, en se disant, mais est-ce, de quel droit on maintient d'autres êtres vivants en captivité Mais si on part là-dessus... J'ai plus rien à faire là, quoi. I think the main thing that I always try to make myself aware of is that every day, if you can, question why we are here, what is the purpose for this, what are we trying to do? Because it's very easy to lose sight of that. And I used to try to walk into the zoo with that same frame of mind that I had when I first walked into London Zoo. That I, I'm seeing this for the first time. What am I seeing? What am I experiencing? 
what's wrong with this? Um, I'd been very, very interested in my early studies in architecture in particularly working class environments for humans. And I was well aware from my own upbringing that poor people had very impoverished environments. London Zoo had an architect's department. I thought, those architects must know how to design for animal behavior. And if I could learn what they, they were doing, I could transpose these lessons to design for human behavior. And I remember the first thing I saw there. There was a gorilla in this larger cage, and he had been living there on his own in solitary confinement for 24 years, and he'd never had any contact during that time with anything that was natural other than the food that he ate and the feces that he produced. So that was the extent of his contact with anything to do with the natural world. These animals were, to all intents and purposes, living in a slum with not even the basic requirements being provided for. And yet, the whole nation was very proud of London Zoo, and the animals were almost like heroes, you know. So I, I knew that this was not the way that zoos should be. But I didn't know, I couldn't express what I thought they should be. And it's taken me a long, long time to get to the point where I think I know what they could and should be. I don't like going to places where you automatically see that it's not working by this hospitalism. Like the animals are moving in a, they're sick. You can see that they're psychologically sick and I just can't stand seeing that. And you can see that all over the world. It's not in any one zoo. These types of enclosures or habitats for animals and those kind of environments really have to be very critical with themselves and say, do I, can we keep this species? Because obviously we're not offering this animal enough to be happy and healthy in, their, in this environment. Um, I think my favorite environments are certainly those where I've got the feeling that I'm participating, like the idea of um, immersing people into a story where nature takes a big part in that story. You can kind of open up people's minds a lot better and easier if they're immersed into an environment that they've never been before. In the New Islands experience, it's all about that. It's all about kind of not noticing where the barriers are. And I think that's a very psychological approach. Obviously, there are barriers. There has to be barriers. That's part of our job. Nonetheless, what we try to do is we integrate them into the landscape so they become invisible. So it becomes like a water element, like a flowing stream, but it's got a certain height that the animal can't jump out. Or maybe it's like a transparent glass wall between planting, so you don't see that either. So we very much like to at least give the thought and the experience of it being an open landscape. 
And that's very much what Chester Zoo is it's doing with islands. We're going to create that landscape that will give you the feeling of you're just strolling through there and how come the animals aren't leaving. What you can see behind me is the uh, interior to the south side of Monsoon Forest. On this side itself, that's where we'll have three indoor dens for the orangutans. Also above that, at height just slightly higher than the uh, guys are working at the minute, will be the boardwalk. Uh, and that boardwalk itself, once you come from outside, will take you above, so you'll be looking down into the orangutans. to use nature as our sample. So if we take a piece of nature and recreate that nature here, we believe right now that's the best way to go for both worlds because it looks great. Um, it looks like a, the natural environment, but it also offers the animal a hell of a lot to, to do, to work with. In the 70s, they thought this um, stylized concrete snowflakes was the way to go. And it was done in exposed concrete and penguins were standing on it and everybody was applauding. They thought that was a great way to do it. Um, nowadays, we're frowning upon that, saying, you know, we need a more natural environment. Who knows what they're going to say in the future? It's amazing how much money you can spend by spraying mud on a wall, huh? <laughs> Only joking. Une présentation dure. 15 ans, 20 ans, grand maximum. Et puis au bout de 15, 20 ans, le public s'est habitué et la nouveauté n'existe plus. Et à ce moment-là, on voit revenir les accusations de prison, d'insuffisance du zoo, etc. Et donc il faut rechanger la présentation. Les publicités très fréquentes des jardins zoologiques, c'est sur le mode « venez sur le territoire des animaux ». Non pas des animaux qui ont été importés en Europe, mais c'est vous qui allez aller dans le monde des animaux. Il y a un renversement complet. Et les zoos deviennent des ambassades du monde sauvage. Et donc, lorsqu'on rentre dans ces parcs, l'idée, c'est que le public ait l'impression qu'il change de monde. On pourrait dire une mise en scène, parce que ça reste du théâtre. Les zoos, ce sont des théâtres, c'est les théâtres du sauvage. C'est une petite minorité de personnes qui ont les moyens d'aller se payer un safari en Afrique. La plupart des gens n'iront jamais en Afrique. Donc le zoo, c'est un moyen de d'avoir, de, de, de s'imaginer ce que peut être ce type d'animal. Et c'est fantastique. Alors que on a cette impression que et les détracteurs des eaux vous diront mais les gens voient des reportages sur ce qui se passe dans la nature il n'y a plus aucun intérêt à venir dans un zoo voir des animaux qu'on a vus cent mille fois à la télé non je suis pas du tout d'accord la relation physique charnelle émotive euh, devant l'animal c'est quelque chose que vous ne ressentez que quand vous avez le contact avec l'animal Aujourd'hui, on a une tendance à appréhender le monde uniquement à travers un écran. Vous voyez des choses, mais ça ne vous touche pas. Un exemple, la relation avec la mort. Les générations de nos parents, on a eu un contact. Quand quelqu'un disparaît, on a derrière une période de deuil et on réussit à faire ce deuil parce que la personne on a vu morte et on a eu un rapport à la mort qui est complètement différent que le rapport qu'on a aujourd'hui. On n'a plus conscience d'un tas de choses dans le monde et de la nature parce qu'on n'a pas plus de contact avec la nature. Et donc, pour avoir une chance 
de préserver la biodiversité, il faut recréer ce contact. Et le zoo fait partie des outils qui permettent de recréer ce contact. I find that people who do have a deeper understanding about animals because they've watched the David Attenborough program and seen the animal in the wild and had explanations given as to why they're behaving in a certain way and how they interact with their environment. But I don't think people are learning anything at zoos. A lot of the television shows and the nature shows give us a fantastic sense of wonder. But it's not the same as being in front of a flock of flamingos. One of my safaris was right after Out of Africa came in. And we were in the Mara in Kenya. And a woman had literally brought a player, like a boombox, a player. And she put on the theme of Out of Africa and blasted it as we were traveling through the bush, she wanted to see the spot where Robert Redford washed Meryl Streep's hair with this loud music playing in the middle of the Maasai Mara, which is one of the most magical places on the bloody planet. We were surrounded with zebra and wildebeest, and all she wanted to do was play the soundtrack from the movie. You want it to be more. And so much of what has happened in terms of all the television and the movies and all that has made us so terribly familiar with animals and animal behavior. We befriend them. We think, oh, I'm different. I understand and love them so much. They will deal with me differently. Oh, yeah? Get out of a car and walk 20 feet, and you'll find out how different you are. The bizarre thing is that 90% of the documentary films on television is about hunting lions, yeah, and hunting kitas. Yeah? There's a lot of violence in these films, and I think overrepresented. When I'm in Africa, I never see a lion hunting. Uh, and I know there are animals there, but I can only hear the birds. I hardly see them. I know there are some deer, but I hardly see them. For me, nature is quite boring. So I look at a film to see some excitement. But the bizarre thing is that the excitement that you're looking for on television, you do not want to see in a zoo. The film creates a sort of distance that you can cope with the violence. In a zoo, it becomes too close, and then you can not accept the violence. Occasionally, you meet extreme violence in the natural world, with animals being eaten alive. Or... But I think there are other aspects of violence. You'll often see them just standing and swaying backwards and forwards for hours and nothing to do. Um, I mean, that's in some ways even a worse form of violence than being, being killed to be lunch. Um, they're not having a horrible death, but they're often having a horrible life. If you met somebody from another planet, then you said, well, one of the things we humans do is we take animals from where they live in the wild and we bring them into our world and we put them in small spaces so we can look at them. And I think they'd say, what the fuck is that doing? I know from having been in this organization 26 years that people come into the zoo in their hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And while they're in the zoo, they connect with that animal. 
It could be an orangutan that looks at them. There is an emotional connection. It could be the flock of flamingos looking wonderful in the sun, whatever it may be, maybe a small fish. The challenge for zoos is to say, okay, how can we take that emotional connection and do something positive with it rather than just, isn't it wonderful, right? Okay, let's go home and watch the television. And that's a big ask. We're looking for behavior change of our visitors. We've gone from a single exhibit to mixed exhibits and to clumps of exhibits from the same areas. And what Ireland is actually is much more involving the member of public. We believe that throughout many parts of our lives, people want more involvement. People want less to be spectators. You know, these days, television is when you want to watch it um, and you can vote and you can be, you're actually involved in it. You're not just a spectator anymore. And I see the same thing happening within zoos. How do we get away from people just something they come and look at to actually really get involved in? That's the philosophy behind Ireland. So while, of course, you walk or go up on the boat around this, these set of exhibits, you're actually you're on an expedition. You're part of a story about discovering different islands, different cultures, the animals that come from those islands, hopefully getting a feel that these places are beautiful, but they're under threat. So it's not the depressing message, but it's this, aren't they wonderful things and there's exciting places out there and you're part of this story, but actually there's, there's an issue you need to know about as well. And hopefully get people's curiosity again and go, like, wow, I've never really thought about Papua New Guinea. Where, where is that? It's a very distorted view of nature that's presented. They'll often go to a lot of effort to create something like a bigger version of the dioramas of the natural history museums. But they're essentially just as fake as those dioramas. Um, I don't think there's any link between zoos and nature at all. I know the, the modern uh, catchphrase is you know, making connections with nature. What people are doing is making connections. I, I don't know what type of connections, but they're making connections with animals. If you go to any zoo that has elephants, you will see something that looks like an elephant. It's the same shape as an elephant, it's the same color, it's the same size, but it's, it's not behaving like a, a wild elephant. It doesn't do any of the things that a wild elephant does. You may as well have a cardboard cutout, almost. You go for the big and the obvious, because it's a whole lot simpler. If you've got giraffes and hippos and elephants, You've got a zoo, <laughs> but you haven't got anything useful. On a pour augmenter le bien-être plus d'espace pour le bien-être des animaux et mettre en place dans ces espaces des espaces végétalisés qui permettent à l'animal de se cacher des visiteurs. Et donc, on a essayé de raconter une histoire aux visiteurs en leur expliquant que on les invitait chez l'animal, qu'on crée une nouvelle relation de l'homme à l'animal, où le visiteur devait faire un effort pour voir l'animal. Catastrophique. Ça ne marche pas du tout comme ça. Si vous regardez... Euh, TripAdvisor, les critiques du zoo, c'est il n'y a pas d'animaux et on ne les voit pas. Donc le public, il est très, très, très déçu. Quand on interroge le visiteur de la ménagerie en lui disant « Qu'est-ce que vous espériez voir quand vous venez à la ménagerie ?» Des girafes, des éléphants, des ours, des lions, des tigres, des hippopotames, des rhinocéros. Alors, on explique aux visiteurs Ici, à la ménagerie, il n'y a plus tous ces animaux parce que on n'a pas des espaces assez grands. Ah bien, c'est intéressant votre concept. C'est bien, donc le public, euh, on a, il comprend. Quand il repart, on lui pose les questions. La prochaine fois que vous viendrez aux eaux de Paris, qu'est-ce que vous voulez voir Des girafes, des éléphants, des euh, rhinocéros, des lions, des tigres. 85%. C'est-à-dire que le public 
se moquent complètement du bien-être animal. Nous, on trouve ça très important, mais physique, finalement, le visiteur, et c'est là qu'on se dit, le visiteur du 19e siècle et le visiteur du 20e siècle ont-ils changé Non. Mais, mais non. <rire> on espère que oui, mais malheureusement, non. La prise de conscience de la perte de la biodiversité, j'ai bien peur qu'elle ne soit que théorique. You drive your car to get a message that you have respect uh, nature. And after you got this message, you go to McDonald's and have a an hamburger. If you still want to use your car, if you still want to drink Coca-Cola, then how can you guarantee a sustainable future for nature that doesn't go together? So either you take this seriously or You give it up because McDonald's is more important for me at the moment than the future of nature. A lot of people believe that agribusiness, as it's called in America, you know, factory farming and technology is really all that we need. And this natural world is something that's like a bonus, but if we, if we lose it, it'll be sad, but, you know, we'll be all right. Well, it's because we don't understand all those interconnections that we, we don't seem to be worrying that we're losing so much of these connections. Because if they go, we go. suggest that all these zoos should be closed. I won't suggest that their ramas should be closed, but uh, they need to be contextualized. I think the more analytical, uh, deconstructing sort of exhibits have more future because it makes us aware uh, of uh, the mechanisms of representation. It makes us aware how to read what we see and that there is a world behind what we see. There's probably going to be stronger prerequisites and regulations in the future about animal keeping. Nonetheless, it's more of a moral question than it is a monetary question, really. And I think that's probably going to be the discussion that will continue into the future, is the moral question about man and animal, who's allowed to control whom. I think um, we, uh, as a species, surround ourselves with a very seductive architecture, uh, culture, politics, uh, religion. Um, and uh, oftentimes we're, we can convince ourselves that we aren't a part of nature, that we're something apart. Thank you.
There's still a lot of people in the world who believe that animals were put here by God for our purpose, you know, and that really, that really distorts your view of nature. A lot of things that we naturally do in our world and the way we talk and the way we refer to nature, it's often in terms of what good is it to us? What purpose is it from our point of view? What do we get out of it? I do remember from very early days thinking that we didn't have the right to own these animals, but I think I just accepted that we did. And I don't think I ever did anything with that thought. It's not an easy one because you have to face up to some aspects that are not very pleasant to accept. It's much easier to just pretend that everything's fine. And empathy is a challenging thing to, to carry because, um, I mean, having empathy for humans or for animals means that you're gonna share some of that suffering. And it's not an easy burden. I've come to the conclusion that to be loved by a human being is not necessarily something you actually want to experience <laughs> because because there's a very fine line between loving something and possessing it or owning it or controlling it or um, having it as something that belongs to you that it, it it's all muddled up in awkward ways and yet, it can be very seductive. Le même mot peut signifier des choses très différentes dans la réalité. Donc, lorsqu'un collectionneur de papillons dit j'aime mes papillons, il n'y met pas la même chose que celui qui aime les papillons mais qui ne veut absolument pas les tuer. Un entomologue actuel, par exemple, euh, a de plus en plus de mal à justifier que son amour des papillons, parce qu'il n'intégrait pas la dimension qui était celle du respect de la vie animale, de l'intégrité animale, voire de la souffrance animale. Et donc, euh, ce qui apparaissait comme mineur autrefois, ça devient de plus en plus difficile à justifier. There does seem to be something that's very deep in the nature of human rationality. That appreciation is very connected to analysis, and analysis is very connected to appropriation. But maybe it's just one of those things we have to recognize about ourselves, just like, for example, we recognize that the desire to dominate other people is pretty deep in human nature. And once we recognize it, then we create institutions and systems that try to prevent it, to try to safeguard it, that are intentionally designed to keep us from acting on those impulses that we have. And I think obviously we need something like that with animals and we have to come to see ourselves as just part of the citizenry of nature and not as an exceptional species that has the right to use nature for all of its own purposes. It's easy for philosophers and idealists to say this is how the world ought to be. And it's another thing for people whose job it is to manage real institutions that have stakeholders who they have to please to actually figure out how to take these values on board. So how do you manage the elephants that exist in the zoo system in a way where they have the best possible lives? And how do you support that? So I have a lot of sympathy for people who are in that business where the rubber hits the road of really trying to make things happen. And I think it's important for people who have idealistic 
views, uh, to not constantly be in a position of complaining and criticizing, but uh, also recognizing that there's the world of ideal ethics and then there's the world of transitional ethics. It's not enough just to describe the best of all possible worlds, according to me. Pourquoi conserver la biodiversité Et quelle est la place de l'homme dans tout ça Et là, la biodiversité, on la conserve pour l'homme. Même si on a une vision, qu'on ait une vision anthropocentrique ou écocentrique, on la conserve pour l'homme parce que la biodiversité n'a pas besoin de l'homme. C'est-à-dire que quand on dit on va conserver la nature, c'est pour nous préserver nous-mêmes. Parce que la nature, le jour où l'homme est parti, la nature, elle existera toujours. L'homme a, a 10 millions d'années sur Terre. La vie en a 3,5 milliards. There are animals that are going to go extinct, and we have no control over it. It's just a reality of life. We have to ask ourselves very big questions about um, what we value. I mean, here we are, struggling for conservation. Is that really that important in our society? We think it is, but is that just a small little group of us? So, what are you going to do? You can only do what you can do. Like Akeley, you keep your head down and move. The moment we see them as underlings or as something that we should have pity for because they took form below us, that is not the right way to view animals. We have to recognize that they're part of this world we're in and we're all equal. And once you can start thinking about wild animals in that way, I think it really shifts your perspective, particularly in the context of understanding the whole world of nature and going back to this sense of everything being interconnected. <laughs> 